ha ha, the joke is on you because you didn't eat me. You ate the decoy. I am safe back here. Ha ha. The authentic self. Shrunken, invisible, hidden. Authentic self. Shrunken, invisible, hidden. Authentic self. Shrunken, invisible, hidden. Authentic. I am safe back here. I am safe back here. I am safe back here. I. So that's a classic that we used to use about crack baby. I think that's what we called him, right? <laughs> and then we've been trying to get to crack baby through sad baby. <laughs> Welcoming despair. That sort of... Do I have it? Oh, can't find it. But maybe the doorway is through anxiety. Or that seems like ISTDP's theory or protocol. So instead of going through sad baby, you go through anxiety baby. Or anxiety is not really a baby. Oh. <laughs> anxiety is your consciousness. Anxiety might be the... Anxiety is probably linked to shame. Anxiety might be your creative life force. So let's throw this out here. <laughs> Oops. Now I think anxiety is associated with creativity. It is it's as though the world is knocking at your door and you need to create, you need to make something, you need to do something. It's what makes us human beings. Oh, so if it's your motivation, you need to do something. So if I can trigger your anxiety of crack baby. I am safe back here. I am safe back here. Ha ha. The joke is on you because you didn't eat me. You ate the decoy. I am safe back here. So if you feel anxiety, then you have to create the decoy. <laughs> Danger, decoy. Danger, decoy. Anxiety is a signal for you to to do something. It's a creative energy. You need to do something. It's what makes us human beings. Mm -hmm. Freedom is the, uh, also the mother of anxiety. If you had no freedom, you'd have no anxiety. That's why the slaves in the films are people without any expression on their faces. Oh, this is good too, so... If you can't tolerate anxiety, you might choose the path of slavery because <laughs> you've associated anxiety with danger. You've associated anxiety with making a wrong choice. <laughs> if you make the wrong choice, then your, your decoy will get crushed and you'll get crushed. So now freedom is dangerous or your freedom is freedom from pain. It's not freedom to do stuff. That's a negative identity. That's the never again. But it might be anxiety. And if you have Brene Brown's anxiety. We hate you! 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 Then you're using hatred to crush anxiety's boundaries, and then now you have no motivation, or your motivation is just to fight anxiety. It's sort of this weird inverted stuff. Uh, they have no freedom, but those of us who do have are alert, alive, we're aware that what we do matters, uh, and uh, that we only have about 70 or 80 or 90 years in which to do it, so why not do it and get joy out of it, rather than running away from it? So the missing element is we need to redirect people's anxiety into joy. But we have to bring the anxiety up so they face the fear and realize the fear is overblown. That's the tricky thing. Because right now, anxiety is triggered as... So it's a desire to escape. So it's a desire to escape. We'll have to so talk it's a about desire to escape. We'll have to so it's a desire to escape. 
We'll have to have a desire to escape. We'll have to have a desire to more. So anxiety is a drive to do something, but since anxiety is freedom, and freedom means that you're uncertain and you're overexposed, you want to escape. You can program that anxiety is a signal to escape. If we break, we need to neutralize disarm anxiety as a signal. And then now we can redirect the anxiety to joy. This is opening heavy. Wasn't the plan, but we'll see. <laughs> I think that's a little capsule of the meaning of anxiety. The mu musicians, the men who uh, wrote music, Mozart and Beethoven and the rest of them, they always uh, showed considerable anxiety because they were in the process of loving beauty, uh, of uh, feeling joy when they heard a beautiful uh, Mm -hmm. uh, combination of notes. Now that's uh, the kind of feeling that goes with uh, creativity. That's why I say the courage to create. Creation does not come out of uh, simply what you're born with. That must be united with your courage, uh, which bo both of which cause anxiety but also great joy. It seems that uh, much of our modern culture though is an attempt to cope with this fundamental anxiety by uh, diversions and uh, yeah. what, what you've called banal pleasures. So this looks like this is at least from the 80s, or is it 70s? <laughs> so it's already recognizing society is trying to teach distraction and banal pleasures, or covering up your anxiety with simple shopping consumerism. Yeah. But if you don't have the courage for your anxiety to create something that gives you joy, then you live a joyless life <laughs> and all you do is consume content like Netflix and whatever, <laughs> chocolate, pleasures, and you just binge because you've lost touch with your creative spark of anxiety that leads you to do stuff that gives you joy gives your soul joy. Yeah, well, you just put your finger on the most significant aspect of modern society. that we try to avoid anxiety by getting rich, by making uh, $100,000 when we're 21 years of age, by becoming millionaires. Now, none of those things uh, lead to the joy, the creativity that I'm talking about. Uh, one can own the world uh, and still be without the inner sense of, of pleasure, of joy, of courage, of creation. So if our anxiety has been programmed, it's been linked to... So it's a desire to escape. So it's a desire to escape. So it's a desire to escape. We'll have to so it's a desire to escape. We'll have to so it's a desire to escape. We'll have to talk about anxiety more. And then you live obsessed with your decoy. Aha, the joke is on you because you didn't eat me. You ate the decoy. I am safe back here. Ha ha, the joke is on you because you didn't eat me. You ate the decoy. I am safe back here. 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 I. That's avoidance by abandoning your territory. I am safe back here. 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 I Wasn't that partially what I was trying to bring up to Jody that, oh, you set boundaries and you reject and reject and reject and you just leave your job, leave your relationships, just leave all the time, set a boundary and leave all the time. You're just abandoning everything, and then you just come to this conclusion. <laughs> That's not connection. That's not connection. That's not connection. That's not connection. Or the longer version. Let's see. Uh... 
can't see it. There's oh. no connection possible. I can't see it. Everyone that is observing me can't see it. That's not connection. There's oh. no connection possible if I'm feeling this way and it's not being so, observed by there. anyone else. There's oh. no connection possible. I can't see it. That's not connection. There's oh. no connection possible. I can't see it. That's not connection. I can't see it. Now, isn't this kind of ironic that if she's rejecting or she's taunting, like when she said observed, is that, let's see. If I'm feeling this way and it's not being so observed. Listen to this. Look at that posture when she says observed. Observed. Let's, <laughs> observed. Like she's biting your head off. <laughs> Why does she need to enunciate and taunt you when saying, saying observed? Not being observed. <laughs> That's her subtle, subtle body language here. How dare you not observe and cave to my interpretation? Way and it's not being so observed stay by there. anyone else. So this is a tricky pointer I've been trying to to show you how weaponized absence is the key to abuse. <laughs> the absent part of using people. <laughs> the threatening of rejection female disapproval, the not giving you feedback, the leaving you hanging and just turning your back on people. All of that is absence. <laughs> Transactional love, conditional love, uh, do this or else, or you need to fix yourself because of that. All of that is weaponized absence. Setting boundaries and saying, if you don't do the boundary, I will leave you. That's weaponized absence. Then we label people who have abandonment terror. We give them another label. <laughs> when all of society is constantly giving demands and threatening rejection, shouldn't it be reasonable some people have abandonment terror because that's the whip that we give everybody? <laughs> now we'll label a stigma on it <laughs> and threaten more abandonment. Isn't that a mindfuck? <laughs> So, pulling from presencing, Octo something, Sherman, Shermer, presencing, I'll put it in somewhere, Otto Sh Sharmer, <laughs> presencing.com. So he has a nice chart for absencing, that's where you start with denying. <laughs> You get stuck in one truth. <laughs> then you stop sensing. You desense and entrench. Then you go tribal. Stuck versus us versus them. <laughs> Good versus bad. Black and white. And then you dig in. That's holding on. That's where you try to willfully convince someone else. Like, I want to convince you. 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 I want to convince. And then what do you get? So when you start trying to willfully force the truth onto someone else and yourself, you start falling into manipulation. Self gaslighting or gaslighting in general, brainwashing, then self delusion or other delusion, and that's starting to abuse. <laughs> And then, then destroying, you disembody and then you see your scapegoat or the target as all bad and you try to destroy. So we're going to try to talk about presencing by Act 3 or in a couple of future meetings because this is harder. <laughs> Number one is opening your mind and suspending judgment. So you got to take in stuff without 
overlays. <laughs> Try to see what you're seeing. So if you have an overlay of a narcissist and you see someone that's a broken narcissist, you don't want your overlay of a narcissist to not see the potential traits of a fragile narcissist that's right in front of your face. So you got to suspend your prejudgment because that's filtering your perception. So that's opening your mind. And then you want to open your heart. So then you want to feel your senses. Does this feel abusive? Does this feel anxious? Does this, do I feel pure rage and contempt at me? Make you have doubt, have doubt, have doubt. Laden with contempt, 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 laden. I really want to see more cynicism from you guys. Oh, I deleted that one. Darn it. <laughs> laden with contempt, 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 laden. So if you feel contempt and you keep your heart open, you can sense that. <laughs> but if you're just listening to the words and you're seeing that they don't match the overlay of a charming, whatever you perceive or have learned in narcissistic life, then you're not going to see them because they're masking their contempt. So that's where open mind and open heart is the foundation to becoming more present. That's the opposite of absence. <laughs> Not an abandonment fight where both people set boundaries and try to roll each other to a, a win, a competitive type bullshit. And then opening will. So this is sort of radical acceptance, surrender. You have to trust your presence and you have to trust your instincts. Reintegrate your survival instincts. Reintegrate your intuition. Reconnect your voice. <laughs> Find your being and let go into that. Your natural will, your natural protective instincts. This is tougher. We don't teach this. We role model this. So we copy ICTBD and all these other models that are getting towards presence. And then we try to integrate that into our lifestyle. And then what do you get? Then you have letting come. So you have wisdom that just comes out of nowhere. Insights that come, spontaneous energy that comes, creative joy that just comes when you have open will. And then it crystallizes and maybe you have, now you have action in acting. And then now you have embodied wisdom. So you get the life force come through you. It helps you act properly or act with some gusto. And then you have embodied doing, creativity, life force. Easier said than done. <laughs> Absencing. Okay, here's a video. What is it that the, uh, uh, the attachment-based therapist does that contrasts it with what you're referring to here as differentiation-based psychotherapy? One of the ways that uh, attachment-based therapists uh, set up reality is the working on the absence hypothesis. It's the idea, although this is not the language of attachment-based therapy, this is the observation of what they're actually doing. They're working on the absence of things. They're setting up a world in which the major cause of marital problems are caused by the absence of attachment, love, acceptance, empathy, communication, validation. But it's the idea that it's the absence of things that are causing things. And you can see it also come up with the idea that couples are out of connection. There is the absence again, the absence of connection, and the goal of therapy is to put in what is absent, put in what is absent, put in what is absent. So there's an assumption of absence, and then you could have an assumption of absence of saying, that's not connection, 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 that's not what if that's not connection means something else? It means that's not connection. That that's not behavior I like. <laughs> that's not connection I want. There's connection. 
There's engagement. There's presence. But I choose not to accept that. That's not good enough. So she's just shaming reality and she's shaming other people. <laughs> and this is tricky because boundaries and setting demands and mental health is teaching this sort of I want, I want, I want, I want. Uh, this empty validation, this sugary stuff. And they say, they're saying that's love. They're saying that's compassion. They're sharing, they're saying all this sort of fake artificial empathy, this fake compassion, this fake caring, this manipulative empathy is love where it's just manipulation. It's conditional love. It's transactional love. It's, you know, I give you a, a empty compliment. You give it back to me. You keep up the pretense. That sort of this immature love. So we're going to go. Also back to the 80s or the 70s into a, a Jungian uh, student or a Jungian expert and see how this lands. <laughs> Forgive the old video. But this is a pretty good message. That is only inferior feelings. For instance, in the happenings of young people, mu musical happenings, they liberate their feelings and it comes out as a feeling of loving everybody or destroying everything in a kind of all over the place way, not? All or nothing. You see this in those artificial vulnerability groups where you have, oh, I love everything and love is everywhere. Until I get pissed off, I want to destroy everything and reject everybody. <laughs> Love is some grand thing that somehow equates to hatred of also grand levels. This out of control. Love is also out of control. Hatred, rejection, cancel culture. We're seeing it in society. This, this is immature love that we're being taught as ideal. Individually pointed while a differentiated feeling is to love that unique person for its uniqueness which presupposes that you are capable of seeing the uniqueness of the other. This is a muscle that the next level of this group is going to try to teach and will probably fail. But <laughs> Developing the ability to see the uniqueness in others. And if I can teach one of you guys to do that, so then you can see it in me, so then I can finally have someone to witness my uniqueness. So. It's a self-serving goal. <laughs> Society doesn't have this. We don't have witnesses. We don't have elders. So we'll have to create it, maybe. Of getting rid of all schematic psychological judgments to also see... See, getting rid of all your s schematics and your projections of the way this should be, she's doing the same thing as describing opening your mind and opening your heart. But that's inherently empty. You're trying to empty your preconceptions and empty your closed heart to open it to receive a person so you can see their uniqueness. You have to be whole or be empty. This is hard. The other person as a unique person and not have some cliché judgment about them. So liberation of the heart would mean to, be, to become slowly capable of feeling and sensing the uniqueness of the other's personality and to lo love that uniqueness. And that doesn't mean this Christian all-pardoning, sweetie pie, strawberry sauce pie. love. <laughs> it means, on the contrary, a, a very great precision of feeling if one talks to them in a not quite genuine tone or makes even a not quite genuine gesture of the hand, they are already shocked. They, they feel the uniqueness and they want you to be yourself. I think that's the most important thing for a psychologist, for instance, to love the genuine person of the patient and to be quite openly disliking all what is not genuine in the patient brings out in the other what he or she really is. 
is really meant to be by nature. And that is real love, a love which heals or makes the other person whole, which makes the other person oh, right more he And that is real love, a love which heals or makes the other person whole. It's all love. So when the spiritual people are saying that, that's true. <laughs> but you need a love that sees the other person's uniqueness, that makes helps make them whole, that welcomes their pure being and their soul. And that this love demands that person, the other, to incorporate their uniqueness. It's none of this decoy crack baby bullshit i am safe back here i am safe fuck back hiding here. i am safe this is the love back that here. judges I am safe. safety back here i <laughs> this is a love that demands being this is a love that demands connection it's not a love that just rejects and rejects and rejects and rejects so when they say all love in the spiritual text it means all love, this love is burning away all delusion. It's burning away all artifices. It's, this is a terrifying love. This is a strong love. Which makes the other person more him or herself. And that has nothing to do with sentimentality or being just sweet or polite. It's very tiring. It, it's uh, having constantly a pre quick, precise reaction to how the other really is, or is not, or should be. To be quite openly disliking all what is not genuine in the patient. Openly disliking all that's not genuine. Is that openly almost hating <laughs> deception and falseness? Are we allowed to do that in society? <laughs> We'd be called out by cancel culture for being a hater. <laughs> for taking away people's safety false artifices, their masks, their facades. That would be taboo. Let's see, 18. Oh, we have time. So boundaries. You can prioritize me first. Or you can prioritize we first. Or maybe it's boundaries is me first. And bond is we first. <laughs> Do we have a bond? How can I protect the bond? How can I figure out what kind of bond do we have? <laughs> How do I invest in building a bond or bondage <laughs> to we first? Boundaries are a wall. Let's get bonded. Let's get invested in something. Let's work on something together. Let's use my create. Let's use our creativity on that. So, if we're creating bonds, how do we create bonds better? Instead of saying, "Somebody else do the work," instead of saying, "That's wrong, that's wrong, that's wrong," I don't like this. Let me change somebody through outrage. What do we do? What you need in a friend is a co-historian. 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 What you need in a friend is a co-historian. 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 What you This is a tricky thing. Most of the therapies out there are going to teach you you need to fix yourself on an island. You don't need other people. Or you need to fix yourself first, then you need to make friends. If you don't have other people to reflect and you have relationship wounds, you can't fix yourself by yourself because you can't mirror yourself. So you need a co-historian or you need someone that will help 
make sense of your unconscious content or help you sort out your internal mess. And that's this sort of pointer from ISTDT. When you do your resistance work, you're always making links to the past, you're making links to his current problems, so he begins to understand why it makes sense. Otherwise, Samantha could look like some narcissistic person and think, what are the feelings about me? What are the feelings toward me? What are the feelings, you know, she could seem like some crazy narcissist, right? So it's very important not to, not to do that, but to be always making links between what's happening here and how that makes to link to social situations, how that links to father. So the patient begins to realize, oh my gosh, this is the pattern that connects everything. This is the pattern that's causing my problems at school, that's causing my problems in social situations, uh, that causes problems with my father. This is the pattern that connects everything. And in this way, then it also helps the patient then begin to reflect on this pattern. And then he understands why Samantha is asking for these feelings, not because she's just a narcissist. She's asking these feelings for these feelings toward him in order to sort out what's what drives this pattern uh, of relatedness that's that's crippling his life. This is the pattern that connects everything crippling his life. This is the pattern that connects everything. So if therapy and self-help is absence and weaponized absence that's manipulated, could they be giving you a giant cover story or a time waster that you need to search in the past, you need to search here, you need to copy this, when your pattern is right in front of your fucking face? <laughs> your pattern is getting repeated in every single new relationship every time you get triggered. And if all you're doing from therapy is covering up your triggers, <laughs> you're just fooling yourself with artifice. I am safe back here. I am safe. Binging back on here. safety. I am safe back here. I. And not just looking at what's in front of your face. That's like, uh, Anna Akana had this recent thing about self-sabotage and pay attention. Anybody can see what her core wound is <laughs> or what the missing element is in this reveal of her frustration because she's triggered by her failure of all this uh, self-work. She did a self-sabotage, folks. It's like every time you think you've evolved. See, so that's guilt, shame attacks. <laughs> now she has a story to, to say why she's wrong. Let's hear what it says. It's like every time you think you've evolved out of a level of your self-work, then the universe is like, ha ha, bitch, you thought. But something my therapist and I talk about all the time is how being triggered is actually a gift. Intellectualization instead of going to the trigger. Let's talk about the trigger. <laughs> Let's make an injunction about the trigger. Let's see how she unpacks it. It illuminates where you still need to do the work. And something I'm realizing is just how if it illuminates where you still need to do the work. See a tell right here? <laughs> see her inner child? See her decoy? The authentic self. Shrunken, invisible, hidden. Authentic self. Shrunken, invisible, hidden. Authentic. Authentic self comes out for a second. Right? <laughs> Doing the work. Ugh. <laughs> One clue. <laughs> and something I'm realizing is just how afraid I am of being seen. Second clue. <laughs> afraid. Her anxiety. See? Anxiety is the missing link. Not sad, baby. <laughs> afraid of being seen. <laughs> of true intimacy. Intimacy phobia. Of letting someone in. Connection. <laughs> she might be also fearing connection. That's not connection. That's not connection. Connection has to be That's on her terms. Connection. That's not connection. <laughs> She's having a visceral movement around letting someone in. Just the idea of letting someone 
see her is terrifying. And that! And all of us are going to get oh, triggered see? at one point or another. There is a second disgust tongue thing. <laughs> she knows it, see? <laughs> or her, her true self knows it. It's right there. And all of us are going to get triggered at one point or another, right? Like, that's just inevitable. What matters is how you handle it after the fact. After your little flipped amygdala comes down and you're like, whoopsie days. Look, she's got amygdala metaphors and neuroscience. That's going to help her know herself or help her police herself more. See, that wasn't rational. To take full responsibility for your actions, for your behavior, to apologize, and most importantly, to change that behavior, to make an actual commitment to change behavior, because an apology without change behavior is emotional manipulation. So happy being triggered and learning and growing, because the work never ends, yay. Mm. The work never ends. Is this joy? <laughs> Has she turned her anxiety into a desire to create and do stuff that creates joy? No, her anxiety is to run away from her triggers. <laughs> And it's in her visceral reactions. It's in her body language. It's in the tells. All you need, all she needs, all of us need is being triggered and somebody to help reflect. <laughs> Be a co-historian of how our triggers are revealing ourselves. This is a tricky thing. So one thing is, uh, a different type of listening. This is a bit advanced or not advanced. I'm not sure we'll throw this out here. Right, we have many kinds of listening, right? We can listen to manifest content. You don't need to memorize all six of these, but if you want to, it'll be repeated at the end. It's mostly talking about latent content, but he lists five other types of listening. The manifest content, we can listen to conflict, we can listen to process, we can listen to latent content, we can listen to enactment, we can listen to counter-transference. That's like six kinds of listening, and that's that's a small count, okay? So, like, everybody thinks they know how to listen, but actually, as therapists, like, wow, when we listen, we have a, a minimum of six ways we can listen. Mm -hmm. And you're just saying, wow, when you and I you listen to it in terms of manifest content. Oh, yeah, he doesn't want to talk to people. Now, when we listen to latent content, oh, he doesn't want, right now, he doesn't want to talk to me. It's like when you can learn to listen for latent content, it's like a, a whole no, a whole new world open. This is a missing element that can't be taught. So you either have it or you don't. And if you don't, you're doomed forever. But maybe it's contagious. If you hang around people who have it, you might be able to get a little of it. <laughs> but you can't learn it. You just sort of... You can steal it from people. So if you can hang out with people who are good at listening to latent content, some of it will rub off on you. But you can't learn it. You can't memorize it, because that's manifest content. <laughs> that's rational listening. This latent listening is more intuitive. Actually, it's unlearning. You need to learn how to <laughs> open your mind, open your heart, open your will, and you'll see the latent stuff. It's taking away layers, maybe. That's the challenge. up to you as a therapist. I mean, and when you listen this way, and you're like, like at social gatherings, you're going to have some very interesting thoughts and insights <laughs> occur to you when you can hear light and content. It's 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 really, it's really a, a portal for the unconscious. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So another thing you can do, uh, uh, and something I I would do in the past is, you know, uh, I might transcribe a session and then I might translate everything into light and content. Mm -hmm. See, just to get used to hearing the light and content. Right. So this is what we do when we watch film. 
So you have the experience of Jody. Then you can rewatch it. And you can see your triggers. And then you can come here and you can discuss it. So you can see the underlying behaviors, the hidden communications, the latent content, your own latent content of your triggers by her experience. And understanding things more from a broader contextual listening base <laughs> helps you see through distortions. It helps you see through manipulations. But it's not something you can memorize, unfortunately. It's not something I can turn into five steps. I've, I've failed multiple times of creating mental models and visuals and simple breakdowns of 10 million different flavors to you and it still doesn't absorb because it's not the simplifications it's the skill of seeing what's happening right in front of your eyes that's this latent latent content process content conflict content behavioral content we have many kinds of listening right we can listen to manifest content we can listen to conflict we can listen to process we can listen to latent content, we can listen to enactment, we can listen to counter-transference. Oh, counter-transference and projection, that's also a skill to see when you're projecting. That's sort of a skill of therapist, and this was perfectly timed right when Laura's leaving, but she'll still be here. <laughs> uh. Should I start by telling you something about the client or, or what do you think I should? No, no, because because if we hear about the client, then we can make stuff up about the client we can make stuff up about the client. Okay. You know, we'll hear the history and oh, well, maybe it's this and maybe it's that, you know, I don't know about you. But when I was in graduate school, I wasn't taught how to think about patients. I was taught how to project onto them, make up stuff taught and rewarded on how to project on the patients. Imagine that. Look at this reveal. I was taught how to project onto them, make up stuff about the patient, project onto them. So we would hear the history and then we'd make up stuff about the patient, project onto them. And then if you speculated and projected a lot, then you were considered a good student because you had good class participation. So here, uh, I don't ask for history because our focus um, really will be just on how the patient responds, how to understand responses. So we can really think clinically about the situation you're facing, how the patient responds, how to understand responses. So the more mental layers you have, the more emotional flashbacks you have, the more content in you have your head, the less you're seeing of what's here and now. The less objective you can be, the more biased you can be. Are you going to be? So that's where like emptying processes and mindfulness and journaling, it helps you empty some of your excess content so you can actually see what's happening. You can listen and notice latent content. That's what I do when I write my, my notes for my cases. I think that I go to the other levels. Duh. Like, that was really helpful to think about. I'm, I need more thoughts about that, like all those levels. Mm. All the levels, different styles, latent, other layers, layers, levels. But actually, you don't need to. You just need to incorporate more BDSM into therapy. This would be... The other alternative. Does submission usually hide lack of collaboration, promote a stance of incapacity? Well, if a patient is submitting to me, she's not collaborating with me. And I'd say to him, yeah, but if you submit to me, we'll have the same awful relationship here that you had with your father. Why do that? Repetition compulsion. And the therapist gets paid. That's why. What? It's perfect. <laughs> Because this submission is just the way you learn to hide with your father. But if you submit with me. Hiding is absence, weaponized absence. We just keep role playing fawn self. Authentic self. Shrunken, invisible, hidden. Authentic self. Haha. -ha. The joke is on you because you didn't eat me. 
you ate the decoy. I am safe back here. Haha. <laughs> we just make our decoy or we make a new fawn self and we just have this pretend interaction. But the therapist can make it better by teaching you some BDSM. Then you'd be hiding from me too. So could we look underneath this facade of the submissive son and find out who you really are? You notice when you frame things in this way, now the patient says, yeah, I would like to take a look at those feelings. Yeah, I would like to find my power and capacity. I, I would like to know who I, I, I would like to stop having to be the submissive son. The therapy needs to make sense for the patient for him to do it, right? And, and, you're, and pressure to feelings needs to make sense to the patient. Otherwise, they're just submitting to you and they're, I don't know why you're asking this, but I hope it goes somewhere, but I'm going along with it. Well, then we just have a, you know, we basically have a sadomasochistic relationship and we're calling it therapy and we get into problems. Basically have a sadomasochistic relationship and we're calling it therapy. I don't see what the problem is there. The therapist punishes you and punish, pushes you for feelings. Then they emotionally masturbate you and it's a win-win. How is that not therapy? <laughs> let me open up your trauma. Then let me give you a band-aid fix that'll hold you down for a week or two. And you come back next week and they do the same thing over again. Emotional prostitution is beautiful. Pretend relationship. Maybe that's partially what uh, this video is covering. <laughs> Since this came up in the, my YouTube comments stream recently. Psychoeducation can be, I think, often a false therapy. It makes the therapist often feel better than the client. The big danger here, and I think this is very rife at the moment, is that we can teach people into feeling better. And I think that's bullshit, particularly for this clientele. You can't teach people into feeling better? Why would he say something so depressing? It doesn't mean there isn't a place for psychoeducation, but psychoeducation can be, I think, often a false therapy. It makes the therapist often feel better than the client. And then the client's in a position that's what matters. Therapist's comfort and expertise and grandiosity is number one. <laughs> Patient gets attention number two, because it's me first, not we first. <laughs> it's only the cover story of we first, but ultimately when trauma happens, I'm saving myself. That's, that's the rules of trauma. And the client's in a position of having to either reject the psychoed or feel completely unheard and unresponded to or compliantly agree, in which case you have a pretend relationship. A pretend relationship. But pretend relationships are safe. I am safe back here. I you don't get am safe seen, back here. At least you're I safe. I am safe back here. I am. You get some emotional masturbation so it feels like intimacy because you're being invaded psychologically but it's a lovely pretend relationship it's enmeshed and messy we need to not collude with hiding because hiding is a big part of the shame response and i think self-hate leads to a lot of hiding what are the signs of hiding well there are Obvious signs of shame, gaze averted, uh, hunching, soft voice, silence, etc. But there are less obvious signs of shame, uh, avoiding subjects, intellectualizing, attacking, getting angry, etc. They've adapted uh, so they don't look ashamed. We often don't see it, so you have to guess. The most important thing, I think, is to create the space where we allow a safety for them to be able to present what is personal to themselves and for us to receive that and respond to that. In now this is more story-based, it's not ISTD-based. 
But this is assuming that somebody is actually hiding. I'm making an argument that all you need is to look at anxiety, call it out. <laughs> and they're not hiding anymore. <laughs> anxiety is in their muscles. Anxiety is in their overexpressions. Anxiety is in their defenses. All you have to do is slowly put a spotlight on their anxiety and your anxiety. Get used to just looking at straight in the eye of someone's anxiety in their defenses, in their avoidance, and just call it out. Not try to convince them. <laughs> just point it out. But you can also create a space and build a bunch of trust and put years and years of that and slowly the little mouse comes out of the cage. And then you try to connect to it, then it runs back into the hole and you do that rigor moral for a long time. <laughs> that can still work. In a way that recognizes that this is extremely difficult because a lot is hidden. Encourage, but don't push and be aware of subtle disjunctions and invite exploration and repair. Encourage, but don't push. Invite exploration and repair. So exploration and repair. So rupture repair is more important than boundaries <laughs> or conflict. Conflict is just conflict. You try to avoid conflict, you don't build the muscle of rupture repair. So might be better to break more things so you can learn how to repair things because that's that's more important be wary of big positive words like proud of yourself my client d she had done something that i thought was amazing i said you must be proud of yourself and she started to retch in front of me it was way too far for where she lives in her self-hatred even though she was a lot better and had done something really amazing this was unacceptable. She couldn't take it in. Why couldn't she take it in? Because she had self-hate. That defense could have been called out. Instead, he covered it up with another opinion, another story. That's invasive. That's not seeing her where she was. <laughs> That's not giving her self-hate space. It's actually his need for her to feel good <laughs> flooded her and created a dissonance. And she literally started to retch. And that would have been a doorway. She started to retch. She had a trigger. Call out that trigger. Follow that feeling. Ask the disgust for supervision. Let that disgust reconnect her. Instead, he could look at the disgust and said, oh, fuck, I fucked up. <laughs> Let me make another rule so I'm a better therapist. <laughs> Instead of saying, that disgust, that's a doorway to more integration. Because he's not a jazz musician. So, look at this metaphor. And I remember that we were playing So What, one of Miles' compositions. So, Herbie Hancock and Miles Davis, maybe? Musicians from the late 50s, I guess. The music was was tight, it was powerful, it was innovative, and fun. We were having a lot of fun, and it was, the music was on. Tony Williams was burning on his drums, and um, it's on. So it was right in the hot. middle of Miles' solo, when he was playing one of his amazing solos, and I'm trying, you know, I'm in there and I'm playing, right in the middle of his solo, I played the wrong chord. A chord. Look what he did. A chord that was, it just sounded completely wrong. It sounded like a big mistake. He made a big fuck up. What's going to happen next? Is he going to be shamed? Shamed for being curious? Shamed for being curious? Is he going to be hated? We hate you! We hate you! We hate you! Miles, is, whole... Miles, Miles is too cool for that. Miles yeah. is going to do the most He's awesome not going to say something like, 
fuck you. That's There's no connect. connection. That's not connection. No. That's not connection. Miles is going to do something else. Why is he going to do something else? And I did this and I went, oh, like this. And I put my hands Checked around my, my, my ears. Jay. And Miles paused for a second. And then he played some notes that made my chord right. He made it correct. I couldn't believe what I heard. He, Miles was able to make something that was wrong into something that was right. With, with the power of his, of the choice of notes that he made and the feeling that he had. And so I couldn't play for, for about a minute. I couldn't even touch the piano. What I realize now is that Miles didn't hear it as a mistake. He heard it as something that happened, just an event. And so that was part of the reality of what was happening at that moment. And he dealt with it. Since he didn't hear it as a mistake, he felt it was his responsibility to find something that fit. <laughs> and he was able to do that. That, that taught me a, a very big lesson about not only music, but a, about life. You know, we can look for the world to be as we would like it to be as individuals, you know, make it easy for me, that idea. We can look for that. But I think the important thing is that we grow. And the only way we can grow is to experience situations as they are and turn them into medicine, turn poison into medicine. Take whatever situation you have and make, make something constructive happen with it. He heard it as something that happened and he dealt with it. What was happening at that moment and he dealt with it. Miles was able to make something that was wrong into something that was right. So that's having the anxiety, turning that anxiety into action to create, to create more joy. Not anxiety about being shamed and rejecting and abandoning and judging and to to protect yourself. This is anxiety that's creating joy, creativity. So the new attitude is to try to say that the answers are in the here and now, especially when you get triggered. So I'm not looking for feelings. I'm looking for unconscious supervision. So when I say, yeah, what feelings are coming toward me? The unconscious is going to send me an answer. Maybe it's unconscious feelings. Maybe it's unconscious anxiety, unconscious defense. Either way, the patient has collaborated and the patient, the next answer is just telling me, this is where I need help. Unconscious, where, where does he need help now? And the unconscious will always give you the answer. Too many times therapists want, I want a feeling, I want a feeling. And the patients, I, I know you're wanting a feeling, but I, I, I just don't know, you know. And they're feeling like you're greed, like you're wanting to get something out of them. Instead, mm -hmm. yeah, we're just asking for unconscious supervision. We're always getting exactly what we need. Okay, so I don't have to get something out of the patient by asking yeah, what feelings are coming up toward me. The next response from the patient perfectly expresses where he needs help. So when I'm asking for feelings, it's never about feelings. It's just where do you need help next? Because it'll mobilize feelings and maybe I'll get anxiety, maybe get resistance. That's all right. Oh, you need help with resistance. Oh, you need help with giving up. He's going to feel angry. He's going to feel love. He's going to feel grief. He's going to feel pain. He's going to feel gratitude. He's going to feel everything. It's just, mm. what order does it come on? What order does it come on? Hopefully, we'll kind of help free you up in your pressure. It's just, yeah, yeah, where do you need help? And you're just asking the unconscious. I'm not looking for feelings. I'm looking for unconscious supervision. So when you look for unconscious supervision, your job is to reflect back and make links and be a co-historian. What you need in a friend is a co-historian, co-historian, co-historian. What you need in a friend is a co-historian, co-historian, co-historian. What you need in a friend is a co-historian. 
And even if you're a co-historian with someone who's an abuser or a narcissist or a monologuer, can that still work? Maybe so. <laughs> they might not want that. They might want you to join them in shared fantasy. But you can be co-historian for reality, or you can uh, guide their attention with different questions. So you could first uh, start listening to more latent or unconscious communication like this. Think out of the box. If there's one thing that you could do to, like, you'd want to see or just throw out there in terms of uh, a revolution or a change in psychoanalytic psychotherapy from your years of practice, what would it be? Just I, I, radical. Stop listening to the content of what the patient is telling you and read the interaction. Mm -hmm. What is he doing with you? What is he creating in terms of the relationship with you? What is he, how is he experiencing you on an implicit level? What is he asking of you on an implicit level? People waste too much time listening to endless stories and not seeing what the patient is doing with you because what the patient is doing with you is what they're going to do with other people in their lives. And if they need therapy, right something about what they're engaging other people in doing with them isn't satisfactory and isn't very adaptive. If they're repeating in your relationship what they're doing with you, this is the unconscious supervision. What is he creating in terms of the relationship with you? What is, how is he experiencing you on an implicit level? So someone's monologuing to you incessantly they think you they want your validation or you think this and that but if the if it's still looping they need help thinking they need help sorting it there's an implicit unmet need that can be called out or if there's a need they need supply and you can provide it you can negotiate in exchange, transactional love more consciously, then you won't be resentful. Versus if you just have your covert contract as a codependent, rescue and serve somebody and expect them to give it back, you'll feel resentful. <laughs> so if you're more conscious to recognize that there's a need and you're transacting and you can more consciously listen and articulate yourself then you can win and then unconscious supervision is the theory that your shadow and your unconscious your implicit emotional baggage repetition compulsion is guiding is influencing your life and influencing everybody else's life so if you pay attention to that latent unconscious supervision strings that are being constantly put out there life will be more predictable life will have more options life will seem less crazier but if you're lost you want to interrupt the pattern so you interrupt the pattern by changing the way you ask questions can't just passively read people you need to engage with them engage with them engage with them Stop playing it quite as safe with conversation topics. You want to be a little bit more provocative, a little bit more controversial. To see somebody when they're reactive, we're going to get a better read on what is important to this person, what they're thinking about, how they feel, what they... You have to find what's important for people. And if things are too safe and comfortable, you don't know what's important. Even if you ask them what's important, you can't necessarily trust what they say. <laughs> you have to look for these gems of truth when they're animated, when they're emotional. Value, poking, prodding, poking, prodding a little bit is going to get us more honest reactions than talking about the weather. 
you have to throw people off. You have to throw people off. I like how you said you need to become a, a friendly journalist. One of the tips you give is, you know, ask yeah. unanticipated questions because people who lie are kind of like those social chameleons. If you just ask them the, the typical question, they're going to know the answer to give. But if you ask them like something that a screwball question they weren't expecting, they're going to get, whoa, and it's going to throw them off. What does work is cognitive load. We want to make them think hard. Cognitive load. A liar can't be prepared for every eventuality, everything you could ask. So when you ask stuff that's unanticipated, all of a sudden they're going to have to think. You're going to see a slowdown. You're going to see a wonkiness. The example I use in the book is if you were a bartender and you, you saw an underage person come in, if you ask them, how old are you? They're going to say 21. But if you ask them, what year were you born? The liar is uh, uh, you're going to have to do math, and that's going to be very visible. So unanticipated questions can be really powerful in terms of just making lies easier to detect, making lies easier to detect. The issue is we want to revise those judgments. We get the initial judgment and we don't want to stop there and make a decision about this person. We want to keep hypothesis testing. We want to keep listening and we want to keep revising those judgments. So keep revising those judgments so that they, they can be better and more accurate. Become a friendly journalist. Make them think hard. Stop. Stay curious and stop being in conclusions. Easier said than done. Another thing, if you don't have questions, if you're not good at questions, this is a hidden question, another tactic to get information from an FBI interrogator, I think. Yes, and one of the techniques that we can get into right now is there's a human predisposition to correct others. So if I give you, a, I make a false statement to you, there's an overwhelming desire in you to correct me. And so if I want to get information from you, I will just give you a what we call a presumptive statement. In other words, it's either a false statement or a true statement, but you're going to corroborate and say, yes, that's true, or you're going to say, no, that's not true, it's this. I wanted to find out, say, your political affiliation. What I'll say is, oh, you're obviously a Republican. And there'll be an overwhelming desire if you're not a Republican to say what? No, no, no. I, no, I'm a Democrat. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like what makes you think I'm a Republican, right? So you get stuck on a monologue, make a presumptive statement that's opposite what they're trying to present. <laughs> yeah. Yes. And I do that in, in my classes all the time because a student will make a good comment about something, and I'll say, during my elicitation classes, then I'll say, wow, that's pretty insightful for a junior or a sophomore. And the, I just remember this one girl, she just was biting her lip and trying not to say anything, and then finally she blurted out, and she says, I know what you're up to, and I'm not a sophomore, I'm a senior. Mm. And she says, now I feel better, because, because she was able to make that correction. So it's interesting that people have this overwhelming desire to correct other people. There's a rule, uh, what, not a real rule, but it's sort of a general principle of the Internet where you might even know what this is called. Instead of saying, hey, how do I get this thing working? Somebody help me with this. What you do, instead of posting a question, you post the wrong answer, and then a thousand people will just sort of violently correct you online. <laughs> So another technique, um, how do we summarize this? I didn't get enough case studies. Ooh. It's all love. Let's listen to Will Smith. The the power of the direction of love and how love actually is a superpower when love is a superpower it's the direction of love <laughs> try to follow but not too hard because your head might hurt 
you can fill your heart with that kind of love. It, it's a propulsion yeah. that is unlike any other thing. It's stronger than fear, it's stronger than hate, stronger than tired. When you can really latch into and fill your heart with love in a way, it really is shield and armor unlike anything that exists. That. that kind of love, shield and armor, love, shield and armor, love, shield and armor. I have a guard up for sure. I have a guard up for sure. I have a guard up for sure. You take this armor off, we die. We die. We die. You take this armor off, we die. We die. We die. That's You take this armor off, we die. We die. That's not. You take this armor off, we die. So if you get in trouble with your armor, just call it love. <laughs> As a term for grandiosity and self-shame gaslighting. <laughs> and say it aggressively and maybe you'll con the audience. But underneath this love is probably... It felt like this was Will Smith for the first time going, okay, is this how you want me to respond or not? It was a lot of things. It was the, the, the little boy that watched his father beat up his mother. All of that just bubbled up in that moment. That's so the question is kind of long because Trevor Noah was rescuing Will Smith. But it's more so during the Oscars, it felt like Will Smith was going to somebody wife mommy is this the way you want me to respond <laughs> and will smith didn't answer it fully a lot bubbled up from the past bubbled up in that moment that's not who i want to be man i understand you know how shocking that was for people man right you know um, Were on you that shocked? stage, you seemed you seemed a little dazed afterwards. I'm yeah, not yeah, lie. no, I, wa I was gone, dude. I was gone. I was gone. I was, um, you know, that was a a rage that had been bottled for a really right. long time. Right. So the rage got out of the bottling. That's how he's explaining the Oscars. What one, I, the yeah? one thing that's killing me, emancipation is. Antoine's masterpiece and the idea that they might be denied because of me. This is a clue that he's still codependent. <laughs> because of me, that's... <laughs> Too many choices. Because of me, 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 Mr. Kramer, because of me, because of me, because of me, what else could I do? I should have never, should have never, should have never, because I should have never, should have never, should have never, I should have never, should have. Now, granted, he's been listening to a bunch of fragile narcissists and gaslighting him, so they're telling him what to say. But his defenses aren't smooth enough to be a, a narcissist. They're, they're, there's too much anxiety. <laughs> it's like, oh, you know, it's like that, that, that is, is killing me dead. You know, and it, it's like the thing that is so critical for me is that, you know, these people came and they trusted me and they were down. Right. And he might disappoint people. That's codependence, weakness on disapproval, failing people. For me, I hope that their work will be honored and their work will not be tainted based on a horrific decision on my part. The hitting of, well, of uh, Chris Rock, probably he got his wife's approval. <laughs> That's why he's still okay with that. <laughs> it wasn't about Chris Rock or the audience. He was enslaved to female disapproval. <laughs> So there's that part. But I thought this was his wound. Idea that they might be denied because of me is like, 
That is killing me dead because of me. Because of me. The slight reveal at the end of the clip, the rest of the clip is just nonsense like this. The the power of the direction of what love the fuck does and how mean? love is just actually rage. is a superpower. <laughs> when you can fill your heart with that kind of love, it, it's a propulsion yeah. that is unlike any other thing. It's stronger than fear, it's stronger than hate, stronger than tired. When you can really relax sure. into and you fill your heart with You take this armor off, we die. In a way, we die. It really we die. is shield You take this armor, armor off, we die. Anything we die. That we die. That kind you take this armor of off, we die. Shield and we die. Armor. We die. Love shield and armor love shield and armor <laughs> so the plea is that you have the armor and you have your facade i am safe back here 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 that comes at a cost that's tiring that's a game that you've been playing all your life and you don't get seen and you're just as scared and running all over all the time running away avoiding avoiding and then you're blaming yourself when maybe you just need a community somebody else to witness you to reflect back to you your true self and demand Make a request for your unique self to come out, to be seen, to be a co-historian. What you need in a friend is a co-historian, co-historian, co-historian. What you need in a friend is a co- oh. What you need in a friend- And just reconnect with your true self through relationships. Relationships where people don't have ulterior motives to try to shape you into their image, <laughs> into their comfort zone. To welcome your true self, your deeper self, your fuller self. Those are hard to find. So. We're working on that. What we need is more interrogation, more interrogation, more interrogation, more interrogation. That might be future meetings. I'll we'll see how to integrate that more. Uh... Ever be, ever be, that's all, folks. <laughs>